with that? Okay. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Jackson Scott. I'm the director of new play development here at Victory Gardens Theater. We do a series of public programming called Dig Deeper that gives us an opportunity to dig down inside some of the themes of the work. Um, and so what we'd like to do today is talk about the mark that Shakespeare has left on uh, contemporary American life. Uh, I'm joined by Michael Halberstam, artistic director of Glencoe's famed Writers' Theater, where he is currently in production on Hamlet. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to be here. Famed. Famed, yes. Uh, joined also by Carla De La Gata, who is a PhD candidate at Northwestern University studying the Latinization of Shakespeare. Hello. Uh, and finally, by Bill Kane, playwright of Equivocation, the show that you are all here to see today. So to start things off, I'd like to ask each of you to share with us a little bit about your first encounter with Shakespeare. And any one of you can start. I grew up seeing Shakespeare in Central Park. Um, hmm. It was the early days of Shakespeare in the park, so I got to know Shakespeare as civic celebration. Uh, it was free. You got online early in the morning. You saw unknowns like George C. Scott and uh, Colleen Dewhurst and um, James Earl Jones doing the plays one after the other. And so, hmm. and one night you got to see in succession Henry VI parts one, two, three, and Richard III back hmm. to back all night long. So I grew up knowing Shakespeare as a performed reality that gathered people in a city. Great. Um, I think my first experience with Shakespeare may have been through a Scooby Doo cartoon where <laughs> the cast, the characters go to a castle and they're haunted by a ghost named Omelette who is a fried egg. <laughs> and I was quite young, obviously, and I told my mom, I was like, oh, Omelette, the ghost of Omelette. She's like, you mean Hamlet? I'm like, no, I mean Omelette. And my mother realized I had some interest in theater when I was pancake number seven in my elementary school play. And I, I don't recall the first Shakespeare play that I saw, but we went to the theater a lot. And my mother wanted to make sure that I wasn't running around talking about omelet and that I knew what was going on. So I think that she took me to a number of shows so that you had the Scooby-Doo version and the Sesame Street version, um, and then you had maybe what she called um, a little bit more of a formal education. So I too came to it through performance and certainly not through reading. Mm. Um, growing up in England, Shakespeare is just a sort of fact of your cultural heritage and environment, but I don't think I really had a personal experience with Shakespeare until I came over to the States in 1980, where um, I was staying up late one night watching television and um, caught the Derek Jacobi Hamlet, which was part of the BBC series, and was absolutely transfixed. Um, found out when it was playing again because... Uh, PBS, of course, replays these things. I think I must have watched it three or four times. And then um, when I started as an actor at the University of Illinois um, uh, acting program in two years later, there was a production of Hamlet playing and uh, I went back to see it, I think, every single performance. There's just something about the play that managed to creep its way inside me and, and never leave. Um, and still with me, I think it's, quite remarkable, I think, how he manages to make himself a part of your uh, in internal genetic, intellectual, emotional, um, cultural, artistic programming. Wow. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there's a, so after the show, we've been doing these, um, these conversations with the audience. Um, and similarly, the way that I was introduced to, uh, to Shakespeare uh, was through performance. It was an assignment in school that you read Romeo and Juliet. I was not about to do that. And so what I did was I watched the Franco Zeffirelli Romeo and Juliet, um, which remains, love Baz Luhrmann, but it remains one of the best. Um, but we, the conversation we were having in the audience, uh, you weren't with us that evening, Bill, but I was sharing with them how you had changed in the space of an evening my, my understanding of Shakespeare. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I came to him in a really um, uncritical kind of way. It's an assignment in school, really important people tell you that he's important, and so he's important. Uh, and I wonder if you could share with us a little bit uh, about how that conversation went with the audience, the kinds of things that you were uh, suggesting to us about Shakespeare. 
Okay, I'll try to be brief. So, uh, but uh, I ran a Shakespeare company for many years, for seven years, and we we played September through June in rep. So, so I lived for a lot of years with uh, with the text, and I adore Shakespeare. The reason I'm saying that is because I'm about to say something that is not as complimentary to Shakespeare as is usually said. Um, I think Shakespeare is a more complicated reality. Okay, relax. How we know things is important. One of the ways in which we know things is Shakespeare. He's the prime artist of the English-speaking world. Nobody compares, I don't think. Um, but he wrote from a very particular perspective. He was hired by the government. He was on the government payroll to write propaganda, to write a version of history that would, in fact, serve the incumbent regime. That's complicated. Now, we don't notice that very much <clears throat> because we just take these as wonderful stories of back and forth. But here's where it gets complicated for me, and this is where equivocation comes from. He was writing in a period in which men of conscience and women of conscience were routinely imprisoned for their convictions. Uh, from my point of view, the play itself emerged when it was during the time of, of uh, weapons of mass destruction and what was called in England the dodgy dossier, you know, the, the whole idea of perhaps this was a government lie, perhaps there are no weapons of mass, of, of mass destruction. And I, so government lies were on my mind and I went into the Tower of London after spending hours and nights and nights and nights at the Globe watching the plays with Mark Rylance's brilliant productions. And in the tower, there is a sign over the rack, official government sign that says no one was ever tortured in the Tower of London because of religion. And technically it's true, um, because if you, were tor if you had a different religion, you were a traitor. So you can officially say, well, these, these people were traitors, but in fact it was religion. And that slippery line made me nervous. And then I went into the cells, and in the cells there are engravings from, from the 1600s, including the gunpowder plotters, uh, whose names are engraved in the wall, although they're hidden, actually, behind cases. You have to ask to have them moved. And one of the first things that I saw was, one of the things I am is a Jesuit priest, and uh, one of the first engravings I saw on the wall was the engraving of a Jesuit priest, engraving his last words in, 16, in the early 1600s. And I started to cry. And I said to myself, which would I rather be as an artist, a prisoner of conscience engraving a few words into a prison wall, or Shakespeare working for a corrupt regime, trying to write a play that ends with, Hail James, King of Scotland. So for me, Shakespeare became, over the, the period of writing this play, a more complicated guy, um, a morally ambiguous guy. Um, would, he be right, would he have been writing for George Bush? if George Bush had offered him enough money. And it's more complicated by the fact, and I'll end, that we know so little about him. We know very little about where he stood. We know much more about Dante's politics from 1300 than we know about Shakespeare's politics from, from 1600. And this makes me nervous, because the view from which we get our, heart, our art is of an anonymous writer hiding behind a text, making history something that is observed as spectacle rather than something to be participated in. And I wonder if part of a poison pill that we get about our own politics is the way that we approach history as given us by Shakespeare, mm. an anonymous man writing in the service of a corrupt regime. And this silence is exactly what happened in the room. <laughs> yes, let me come to you so that you can be picked up on the recording as well. I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to, uh, in my own mind this contrasts with Anne Frank. You know, uh, is Anne Frank a greater artist because it's a more committed art, so. so. So I think the concept of Shakespeare having been a government employee is a revelation to most of us. Can you expand on that a little bit? Was, was, was the king his sponsor and the king in effect employed him? He's, uh, he was on the royal payroll. He was, he, the, the company was called the king, not from the start, but, but after a while they became the king's men. And, and a lot of their performances were done at court. They were the official entertainers at court, and they wrote shows for the entertainment of royalty. 
Um, but certainly, um, the play Macbeth, um, the Scottish play, I don't have any superstition, <laughs> but Angels and Ministers of Grace defend us, uh, yeah. is, is, is what's supposed to take the curse off. And if something happens this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would have happened anyway. But, the, um, but yeah, no, he was, he was a government writer. If he had not been employed by the government, would he have been a writer anyway? Did he have the talent to write otherwise? Ta the talent is infinite. I have no question of the talent. It's well, um, in order for plays to be performed during Shakespeare's time, they had to be licensed by the master of the revels. So an independent playwright would still have to have the play approved in order for it to be performed. Um, and what you'll see largely in the play today is how collaborative the whole playwriting um, process was between the actors and the playwrights and so forth. A lot of times we get this image of Shakespeare alone in a room, quiet, and you see that in, in Shakespeare in Love, and he's up there thinking by himself, which isn't really the way that we understand collaboration. Um, we have different records and, and Burbage's diary. We have a diary of, of different plays that were performed and there's a high number from certain years where we have the information of, of knowing that plays were collaborative. People were working together. What, will, what you later see in, in centuries later in Europe, salons of, of artists coming together to work like that. So even if he weren't government sponsored and he does get there in his career, he still would have had support from a network or, or he would have failed, but he was talented. So. I I would like to um, respond to the notion of Shakespeare as being completely compromised. Um, I think there's a subversion in his writing, and it's one of the reasons that we still produce him and enjoy him so much today. Um, first of all, from my perspective, he's pretty Catholic, um, and I would say that's a theme that runs through most of his plays, particularly in the ideas of... Um, uh, ha relationship between heaven and earth and afterlife. It's, it's Hamlet is, for all intents and purposes, a Catholic play. Um, uh, so at a point in time when it was quite unpopular to be so, I think he was still um, articulating a ca Catholic perspective of the universe. Um, but second of all, I think there's a sort of gentle, um, well, not so gentle, maybe an underlying parody to the way that, or, or uh, critique to the way that he articulates the role of government and the role of king and queen, um, and that the mirror is fairly significantly held up, and I think it got him in trouble quite, quite a number of times over the course of his career, we think anyway. Um, in, in terms of the anonymity issue, and of course we'd have to go into specifics, which we can, we can if, we, if, if you're interested, um, I admire the anonymity of the playwright. I feel the fact that he didn't feel the need to extrovert his personality uh, so much and the fact that we're left with the articulation of his work as, as the enduring legacy of, of his artistry as opposed to um, uh, a complete record of his, the manifestation of his ego um, that's partly what appeals to me to him as, as an artist. I, it's sort of the comparison that I would have, I guess, is um, um, the notion of a thrust stage. We're all pretty familiar with what a thrust stage is today, but how many of you know who Tanya Mazeyevich was? Um, she essentially articulated the contemporary thrust stage with Tyrone Guthrie at uh, the Stratford Festival and down in Minneapolis, borrowed from the globe, of course, but I think prior to the point where the two of them got together and said, what if we make this Shakespeare... Uh, theatre more contemporary um, in its shape uh, and its methodology. Um, the thrust stage, it's lost vogue for essentially, been out of vogue for about 400 years. Um, and I think it's that kind of anonymous gift that we, you can channel into the art form where people actually talk about your ideas and your substance rather than your personality and your ego that I at least strive for in my work partly as a, an inspiration from the legacy of Shakespeare. So there's a suggestion uh, here of a couple different ways that we can look at Shakespeare. We can think of Shakespeare um, uh, in, a, in a much more complicated way. We can think about Shakespeare um, as a propagandist, or we can potentially think of Shakespeare as a subversive artist. Um, do, you, do you think it's like the idea of, uh, I mean, what we do ultimately, one of the things that makes him such an enduring personality is because he is so projectable. I mean, that you, your, your, your viewpoint is, is 
so breathtakingly original and fascinating. Um, and I, I love it. It makes me want to go back and, 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 and study in light of that. But it also makes me think um, that partly the, the, both the gift and the, the um, challenge of an, an anonymous career, the fact that we don't have any really strong direct biographical um, detail of his life, except for some letters, some law records, and, and the entry points of um, when his plays were performed or produced, etc., cetera, um, that he then becomes widely open to interpretation, and we can put on him these ideas and consequently make astonishing statements like the one that you've just made that's going to send everybody in this room and hopefully as a result of seeing your play out to consider the role of an artist in culture and how we interact with and what our political responsibility is in the face of oppressive regimes. It's really a marvelous idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Sorry, Jeffrey. I didn't no, no. Turn. Yeah, hold on. Um, I'd like to play devil's advocate, if, if that's okay, for a bit. Um, in this time period, if you weren't on the side of the uh, uh, monarchy, uh, you weren't backing King, King James, or if King James wasn't, or King James wasn't backing you, um, it was very hard to have that kind of uh, artistic freedom. So I'd like to maybe uh, um, put out the idea that maybe he did take the role of the uh, government playwright so that he could continue writing his plays. And in, in, in his plays, monarchy is not very well looked upon in a lot of his plays. And uh, also, without the protection of, king, of the government, uh, it's ve I've I don't know, I'm not sure about this, but it seems very likely that he would have landed up, uh, ended up in that prison cell and probably inscribed his name on that wall as well and ended up executed uh, later on. So uh, couldn't it be said that the, him being a government playwright was a form of protection and a form of him uh, staying alive to perform his artistic uh, talent? That if I may, yeah. that's, what, that's what my play is about. Shakespeare says, I have two choices, lie or die. Uh, this, is, this is the choices I'm being given. Uh, and he goes to Garnett to learn equivocation because he wants to tell the truth. He just doesn't want to get caught at it. So I think there is a desire to tell the truth. But let me, get, let me give you a different example. Uh, during the blacklist period um, in the United States when McCarthyism was, was big and you had... Um, a lot of writers who simply were exiled or couldn't get work, um, would it have been better for them to have named names, to have, to, have, to have done what it was necessary to do to have a continuing and successful career? Because some people did that. Or is there a question of personal integrity? Um, is that a fair comparison, though? I mean, to name names is to, to actually put other people in jail as a result of your direct betrayal, but Shakespeare, Shakespeare isn't necessarily, insofar as we know, having people put in jail as a result of his plays. No, he doesn't. I, what he, he, he was Teflon. Nothing ever stuck to Shakespeare. You say he got in trouble, but any, Ben Jonson got in trouble. <laughs> ben Jonson couldn't make a move without being thrown in jail. Kidd got in trouble. Marlowe got in trouble, and, and they paid the price for it. But with Shakespeare, Shakespeare was telling people what they wanted to hear. You say he was a Catholic. Um, but that's, that, would, that would have been a laughable idea 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 currently, it's currently the pendulum swing, thanks to Rosenblatt. And it's a terrific theory, and I, I really enjoy it, and this play probably wouldn't exist without it. Uh, but it seems to me that, that in terms of history, specifically in terms of writing history, he wrote a play called Henry VIII. Now, one thing we know about Henry VIII is Henry VIII really wanted a son. Mm -hmm. He did not want a daughter. And the play Henry VIII ends with Henry VIII coming on and taking Elizabeth over the baptismal font and saying, thank God I have a daughter. What could be better than God having given me a daughter? And I look at that and say, really? But he also, made, he also yeah, but paints Catherine of Aragon in that play, who is, for all intents and pur purposes, the mother of, the, of Elizabeth's enemy, right. um, as a fairly sympathetic character. I mean, it's and, the, and same in, in the same in the Scottish play, 
um, in which <laughs> in the, the apparition scene, he comes, the last ghost comes down and brings a mirror. The play was probably performed indoors. The mirror was probably held directly up to the king at the premiere. And Come see the play. We've yeah. got mirrors all over the yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, I think it's, uh, I, I mean, there is a lot of um, uh, donor stroking that's going on. But at the same time, on the other side of that, you have a king making decisions and obsessed with uh, witchcraft and spell making that is not exactly flattering uh, any more than, say, the Duke is in Measure for Measure as, right. as a sort of portrayal of um, I, I think what, what King I, James. What Sorry. I, no, what I consider a lot is the space in which Shakespeare's plays were performed. I mean, London, the city of London, what we know now, now when we think of London, it's much bigger, but the city of London was actually rather small. And playhouses were new. I mean, playhouses in England, structures that were built just to hold plays. And where the Globe was built was, was in, on the south side, on, now on the south side of the river. Um, and it competed with bear baiting, with prostitution, ale houses. This spot, this whole area was called the Liberties. And there were more liberties taken there to do other things and, and entertain yourself and to be entertained. And so there was a great deal of fluidity in language in what was allowed and not allowed. There were laws that were passed. And then, and then at one point, you couldn't um, use certain biblical allusions on stage. I mean, things were changing. And, and the religion, the national religion, changed four times, I believe, within 60 years. I mean, this was a great deal of change going on. And so I think for me, um, when I think about Shakespeare, there's a great deal of tension. And once the master of the revels licensed a play, it was sort of a stamp of approval that it was all right to go on. And what that does is it keeps the theater houses on the outskirts, physically on the outskirts, but a little bit on the outside of, of, of an acceptable art form, even though they perform for the king. And then that way, traitors were the real enemy. So I think what we see in our society even today, there are, there are artists who are certainly on the outskirts who will um, rage against the political, the dominant culture. And then there are the people who are so far to a different side that those are the people who can be demonized or punished. Well, may I, if I may hop on that with Blacklist, um, James, <clears throat> James was executing people the king in this play, it wasn't, it wasn't that he was disapproving of people, he was killing people. Uh, one of the people in the play is Henry Garnett, who is now a major traitor in England, but now acknowledged to have been innocent of the crime for, of which he was accused. Uh, and I believe Shakespeare knew that. And he didn't write a play, or didn't attempt to write a play, in which saying, huh, you know what? Inclusivity might be important and the outsiders might have a point, and in fact, I might be Catholic. He wrote a play that ends, Hail King of Scotland. So he made a tremendous amount of money siding with people who, if he was a Catholic, were killing his family. Do you think Malcolm is, is a sympathetic figure, though? I mean, I think Malcolm is a sort of bureaucratic asshole. Um, and so Hail King of Scotland at the end of Macker's is very... Um, Gray. I, I don't feel like this playwright ever revealed his opinion. I feel like that's what makes why we still go to see him, because he just painted what he saw. It's funny, you know, this image I think, is... But I, th but I think that comes down to us. My concern is our prime artist is someone who never had an opinion. I that, should that artists that have opinions? And I get the sense God, yes. from the conversation that we were having the other evening, I get the sense for you, uh, Bill, that that is the thing that makes him dangerous, potentially, is that he did not have an opinion, or didn't present an opinion. And he took the money. Do you know, I mean, he supported the regime, took the money, and kept quiet about, about the injustice. He spoke flattery to power. And... I don't think there's any denying that. I mean, he really, really wanted to have a crest. He wanted to be recognized as nobility. He wanted to be one of the in-group. He desperately wanted that. And that gets made fun of by other playwrights at the time and all that, yes. all that sort of stuff. But, you know, an artist who can make a statement, and I don't mean a political or an agitprop statement, um, but who can say, hmm, here, here's where I stand. You have to stop killing these people. Uh, that's a powerful statement, and he he never stepped up, stepped up to the plate. It, well, I mean, did Michelangelo, Leonardo I, da Vinci, Socrates? I mean, it's you, the list goes on. I think our greatest artists culturally 
reveal, don't sort of, don't get hung up in a moment of political intrigue, but try to write, I think, a greater perspective. And, and consequently, I think you should come out of a great work of art asking questions, not with a set of answers. Well, I, and for me, I, what I find fascinating um, is how that's, that has been how Shakespeare has been used. So in most of the rest of Europe, um, Shakespeare was, was translated, and translated sometimes two times over, not just from English into French or English into German, but English into German and then into French. Um, and Shakespeare became a, a European playwright, not as a, a symbol of Britishness, but more as, as a subversive playwright because of his staging techniques, his characterization, because of all the different ways that he can be read. Um, and that's how he came to be translated in so many different languages, I mean, from that beginning there, and, and became popular in totally different cultures and different time periods who were under different regimes, but because, because there is a bit of space there. And I think a lot of it has to do with the language. Language was so fluid at the time in a way that, that the, the people living in, in Shakespeare's day could not imagine, I don't think they could imagine our current fascination with something like a spelling bee, you know, in which we, we talk about, um, we compete to make sure that a word is spelled correctly. We, we have a hard time imagining that there were words that, that meant five different things at the same time. And so when you put him in translation and take it to different cultures, then, then there is this fluidity and you can perform Shakespeare to sort of suit the current cultural time period. Did you see um, Edward or read Edward Bond's play? I think it's it has a similar um, perspective. It puts Shakespeare towards the end of his life up in Stratford, looking at the kind of brutality that's going on around him, and then essentially he defends himself as a writer, um, trying to describe what he's seeing rather than take an opinion one, have an opinion one way or the other about it. I think for just this purpose, I can't tell what Ed, Edward Bond's perspective is on it, actually, after seeing the recent revival, the, the Young Vic, although the press were quite quick to, to jump on him for not being socialist enough, uh, or for being too socialist. I mean, there's a, a fascinating, um, it provokes a fascinating dichotomy and, and, and argument as to, um, uh, as to this very question. It's, it's very, very complicated. We, we, have, a, we have a question in the yeah, back here. And I'm sorry. Back to you. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to know um, how you can square the uncritical acceptance of the king with both Richards and um, Julius Caesar and Coriolanus. I mean, don't you see them as being openly critical of the regime? Right. Well, there there were a number of, there were a number of historical texts at the time. Um, the plays that you mentioned, those stories have been told through other poets, and and Shakespeare draws from a, a number of different sources for his plays. When it comes to the Henry the Fourth Part One to Henry the Fifth, there was a a published history called the Famous Histories of Henry the Fifth, and and the history had been told by the historians, but Shakespeare goes to the poets. And, um, and changes it from there. So yes, they're, they're, I mean, to your point, regime is not looked at favorably in a number of Shakespearean plays, but going against the regime doesn't fare well either. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare's characters who do something that's not um, in line with the monarchy pretty much all die. Yeah. So um, he may be critical. <laughs> the divine right of kings is unquestionably asserted through the the process of the right. plays. I mean, Henry Bolingbroke has a terrible, terrible time after he unseats God's anointed, even though God's anointed is right. uh, a pretty shitty king. Right. Until the last few minutes of his life. Where he rises. Yes. To it. He... Well, I'm wondering about um, the subversion element because it seems to me the Plantagenets generally do not come off well. <laughs> um, the Tudors, you think? Uh, okay, you know, and best of all, the Stuarts when James gets to the throne. But I also, in having seen the recent Hamlet up at Writers Theater, and I was really glad you said something about the Kingdom of Denmark, which doesn't seem all that much to us now, but did then. But then at the very end, could it be taken as subversive that they're 
really is no House of Denmark anymore. So by the time Fortinbras, who I suggest is a little like Malcolm, he is kind of a jerk, I think, you know, by the time Hamlet's election alights on Fortinbras, the regime is gone. Yes. The Danish There's a sort power. of tension, I think, that exists, from my perspective at least, throughout Shakespeare of, of artist versus bureaucrat, which I think was a more interesting conversation for Shakespeare. That was the conversation he was interested in when it came to politics. So you have the artist king in Richard II, Hamlet, and you have the bureaucrat in poli the bureaucrat lawyer politician in Claudius Bolingbroke, uh, and that seems to me to be a consistent theme. So he taught, for me at least, he, he toes the party line in making Richard III a hunchback um, and acknowledging uh, Henry, uh, future Henry VII in that play, whose, whose claims to the throne are spurious at the, at the most, um, as the rightful king, uh, a sort of glorious hero on the horizon. Um, um, and it's interesting that in the... Um, the history plays Henry the Eighth is uh, Henry the Seventh is skipped over. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to have seen that play. I wonder if it was written and not produced. Um, but also, also even even within the history plays, there's a lot of stuff that we just accept because it's such good drama. Mm -hmm. But it's really bad historical. Well, it's bad history. You know, the history is written to praise the Tudors and then to praise the Stuarts. I mean, that's what the history is bent for. I mean. Uh, I don't think there's too much question about that. I mean, that's, that's my theory. But if you take something like Henry V, the, Henry the you find yourself cheering things that you really don't believe in. You know, I mean, the war starts because of a violation of the Salic law, because, because you know, we own France. Well, this is untrue, and the play, the play makes it fairly clear that this is nonsense. But because the king is insulted, we, with the audience, go to war and we are thrilled to go to war, and when we win the war, and we, even though we're the aggressors in Henry V, we invade France, we feel that we're the wronged party, somehow. And when we get there, we slay everybody, and then once we have slain everybody, we say God gave us the victory, and somehow we weep. Now this is nonsense. This is everything we abhor about, about politics, and yet somehow Shakespeare slips it by us. So we end up on the side of a king invading another country preemptively because his ego is insulted, lays waste to the, and says before he goes, I will make your wives widows. I will make your children's orphans because you have offended me, because you've made fun of me with tennis balls, my liege. He then does it and says, God gave us the victory, so we, now we sing a hymn. Now, this is nonsense, but he gets, us by, gets, gets it by us. But don't you think that text is also partly what, what or, or do you think it's possible, I should say, because it, obviously we're posting ideas. Um, do you think it's possible that that text is subversive in, in later time, looking back upon the record, knowing that an Elizabethan audience would be predisposed to love Henry V because Henry V was a national hero, but then looking at exactly what you just described, um, that a man goes to war because he's insulted and talks about killing uh, widows and children, that there's a little bit inside us that we don't have to be lovely to the Tudors that makes us go, ooh. Well, I think also the audience was aware of the history, as I said, with the publication of historical records. It, it would be like today, you know, when, when a certain channel will come out with a, you know, a movie about the Kennedys, right? A lot of people have their opinions or have their own knowledge of what happened during the period, but you can watch a more sensualized, exotic um, reincarnation of what was going on and, and balance that with your knowledge of, of history. And it was the same thing for the audience there. And so it, they're it, aware of the fact that there's fiction going on in the absolutely, which of and, course is the, the prerogative of the dramatist. And, it, and and it's a bit of and I mean, it's a bit of fun. And at the same time, it also while it's subversive for saying, okay, here here are wrong reasons we went to war. They're being dramatized on stage. At the same time, it's also reaffirming Britishness. I mean, they yeah. the King Henry V is made to be. Well, a lot more lovely in the play than, than he was in real life. And, and, and the numbers at the end for how many people were slaughtered, are, it, it all makes England look so much better. Um, so it is a very patriotic play um, at the same time that there are challenges. Well, unfortunately, it's just the French. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, I, didn't, I didn't say that. Carla, wh- when you, I mean, you just raised the Kennedys, which um, sort of touches on a conversation you and I were having at the top of the afternoon um, about Shakespeare in the period as being a, a, a popular form mm-hmm. of entertainment. Uh, and sitting here in the audience, or sitting here with all of you, I'm struck by how well-versed <laughs> so many people seem uh, with Shakespeare, not just the history, but also the plays. Uh, can you speak a little bit to how Shakespeare is used in this country? Um, uh, and to tie that all neatly together a little bit, there is quite a large divide, um, I see, uh, that happens here in this country. There are people who have access to Shakespeare in a way that it marks them to have had that access, and there are people who are somehow excluded from that. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. Well, I mean, Shakespeare today is is a marker of culture. And and as I said, my first introduction was, I think, through a cartoon. Um, but at the same time, we have very expensive um, tickets to buy at Shakespeare festivals, and there are also a great deal of free Shakespeare in the park performances. The United States has more Shakespeare festivals than any other country in the world. And so this access to Shakespeare is... Is, is that how how is Shakespeare become accessible? We don't have a national um, mandatory reading list for for education, but most people are assigned to read a Shakespeare play in high school um, that used to be in college, but now it's in high school. And so people have an introduction as this is a marker of culture. It's it's an entree point, and so. Understanding Shakespeare, we now see Shakespeare children's performances, and we, it's still very elite. And so it can be deemed high culture or low culture. There's there's Shakespeare rap music. There's all, I mean, there are little yellow ducks for the bathtub that have Shakespeare's face on them. I mean, Shakespeare is a marketing consumer presence. If you go to a Shakespeare festival or a theater or Renaissance fair, you can buy Shakespeare earrings. You can buy Shakespeare, I mean, Shakespeare coins. And I mean, it's now a commodity. Mm-hmm. And so Shakespeare is part of our our collective conscious. Like, I mean, and when we talk even about psychology, Freud referred to Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare is prevalent on, in so many layers of our culture, it's actually very difficult to, to take him out mm-hmm. um, and to take his works out. And, and in that way, it's still, Shakespeare is still being instilled in our academic institutions as this is a great writer. Your knowledge of Shakespeare will mean that you are part of a literate culture. Um, but what that sometimes moves away from was how was the whole aura and energy of the of the playhouse that Shakespeare was a really collaborative event, and not just with other playwrights, but with the audience going there and being able to see each other because the lights weren't off because they didn't have lights, and all plays were performed in the afternoon, and everybody could see you know other people engage their reactions, and we all know that when we're in a big group at a concert sometimes in a theater, and you can see everybody else, it changes the dynamic. And, um, and I think today, and, and now what we see today are so many adaptations or concepts and different types of performances that what that does is when you see um, Shakespeare in a different setting, in a different time period, it's trying to make something centuries old relevant now. And that speaks, some people will argue that Shakespeare's universal. These stories will always resonate, and that's the power of his language. But the other argument is that that would imply that things that, that moved people 400 years ago move us now. Uh, and some things aren't as funny anymore. Um, venereal disease jokes, for instance. <laughs> they, well, depending. <laughs> yeah, <I like>. um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Before people get the wrong impression, though, I, w- I would like to say I adore Shakespeare. Tw- you know, <laughs> Clearly. Twelfth, Twelfth Night, Lear, and Tempest. I, I can recite all three of them to you, and I think they are among the most... Be- they astonish me, and I use them as prayer books. I mean, these things move me deeply. It's specifically the political nature of the viewpoint that he gives us that causes me trouble. Um, I, as an artist, he's, he's, he's beyond compare, uh, but I wonder about the optique, using him as the lens through which, through which we filter mm-hmm. our experience. I guess from a contemporary perspective in terms of why I keep coming back to him, and maybe this is, um, uh, this is in response to that, is the notion of him as a subversive artist. I, it's very easy for people to say, looking at um, Merchant of Venice as uh, anti-Semitic or Taming of the Shrew as uh, misogynist. Um, and yet, to me, 
and, and saying that, look, Shakespeare doesn't take a stance. And yet, to me, he does take a stance by making these characters complicated. Um, rather than doing what Marlowe did with the Jew of Malta, in which he just takes a definitively anti-Semitic stance yeah. mm -hmm. and creates uh, a parody of a human being, Shakespeare makes Shylock um, just not a very good Jew and actually puts another Jew in the play, Tubal, to respond to Shylock um, in, a, in an extraordinarily subtle way to push back. Um, the he, also, he also makes Portia not a very good Christian. So. Yes, exactly, yeah. and, and, and not a particularly nice person, um, uh, and Bassanio too, for that matter. None of the Christians behave terribly well or in a terribly Christian way in that play. Um, the same with Taming of the Shrew. Um, it's, it's a play in which a misogynist is described and articulated and sent up even and blown up and parodied at the end. It's hard to say that the man who created Olivia or Helena or Viola um, uh, was, was not a proto-feminist, I guess, or um, uh, 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 the, the w did not have strong sense and a strong belief in the understanding of women. Um, and I guess I would say that about his politics. I think he was much more interested in a, a wider perspective than a single political actionable moment in time, and that his political viewpoint is ultimately magnified by his ambiguity in order to cross the ages and the fact that we're still producing him 400 years later in, and that he survives in every regime and ultimately holds a mirror up to um, whatever regime is in power at which the time he happens to be performing is a testament to his ability to ask greater, deeper, and harder questions. And, and I think asking those questions come out as well with the foreign settings of most all of the plays. Mm -hmm. Aside from the history plays, and Henry VIII would be the most recent, um, and that was still 60, 70 years before, before it was performed, all of the plays except for King Lear and Mary Wives of Windsor, all of them are set in foreign places. So not, maybe Venice doesn't look much like it does in The Merchant of Venice, and maybe, you know, Love's Labor's Loss is set in Navarra in Spain. There may not, you may not see it as Spanish, but by putting things in a different place and making these characters from different places, you could have them come in from different viewpoints. It may be subversive, but he's not setting it in, in his present day England and saying this is what London culture is like. Um, That's Johnson. Yes, he got in trouble. Um, so if you set it somewhere far away, we may, it may make comments on foreigners um, to, to, to the Londoners at the time, but it also gave him that freedom to say, here are people coming in from different cultures, and this is the, the words that are coming out of their mouths aren't coming out of mine. Um, he certainly also anticipates the coming of the Puritans. I mean, if Malvolio is not an indictment of Oliver Cromwell, I don't know what is, um, uh, or contemporary um, conservative fundamentalism. Well, of course, but he, there again, he's serving uh no, Twelfth Nights under Elizabeth, right? Uh, yes. Late, you're, you're late fifteen hundreds. Yes, I believe yeah. so. Although My favorite thing about Twelfth Night is there's a wonderful line in there, not. which which says, uh, say "Andrew Andrew Aguecheek yeah. says I'm a great eater of beef, and I believe it does harm to my wit." No question. And the reason for that line, evidently, is it was performed at court, and the beef eater guards were standing all around the theater. So uh, he had something for everybody as far as that goes. You, I mean, you wonder, I, you get the sense maybe that Elizabeth was a more tolerant monarch than James was, but that James was perhaps a less intelligent monarch than Elizabeth was. Because in <laughs> Richard II, there's the famous, um, uh, who knows whether it's fictional or not, encounter between Elizabeth and, and Shakespeare in which she says, know ye not, I am Richard II. And he had the, the question of the... Um, um, the Essex Revolt. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, but with James, you get the sense, I mean, in terms of how he handles him in Measure for Measure and, and Mackers, there's a sort of um, very obvious and front-loaded uh, buttering up of the regime that goes on in those plays at the same time that he's just blasting them um, uh, in terms of how he actually views uh, the Duke and Mac himself, and the politics of the fact that there are no good kings. I mean, the fact that um, Duncan, who's always held up as this Christ-like figure uh, at the beginning of the play, has has made the Thane of Cawdor his his uh, top 
general, uh, his top man, top man in his in his his off his cabinet, and then <laughs> goes on to invite okay. Mac in. We're about ten minutes or so from curtain. Yeah. Uh, so to close, I'm going to ask you all an impossible thing. If you can respond in a word uh, to how uh, to how Shakespeare marks us today, yeah. I think he asks us to be spectators rather than participants in our political lives. Or words. You go first. <laughs> I would go with the antithesis of what you just said, and I think he asks us to take responsibility significantly for our actions and to understand the consequences of them, not only in our personal lives, but in our political lives. I think that he's embedded in our, in our society to the extent that we can grow with him, that you can relate to certain characters at certain times and later relate to other characters, that you can see into it what you want to see, whether it's subversion or political or whatever it might be. It's there. You can see a teenage romance or you can say, you know, unorthodox parents or priests with they shouldn't be doing, but it's there for you. Whichever story you want to see, you'll find it. Lovely. Cool. Thank you very much that was to awesome. Michael, to Carla, and to Bill. <laughs> thank and you. thank you to all of you.